uh, Free Domain Radio on YouTube, uh, at Twitter, at Stefan Molyneux, M-O-L-Y-N-E-U-X, freedomainradio.com. I don't need to introduce him. He's got hundreds of millions of views to his videos, uh, a lot of fans around the world, and he himself is, a, is, is an atheist, but I respect him because he's not a hateful atheist. We can all have our own cosmologies, our own ideas to unify our field theory and whatever. But my problem is so-called leftist atheist who then make the state God. I can't stand big religion. Uh, I can't stand establishment religion. It's totally with the state. Uh, so I agree with a lot of real atheists on that issue that that's a big threat. But I personally have a spiritual side. I have a relationship. I believe in high, higher power, but he respects that. The point is he has piercing analysis on the history. Because I've done my research. He knows what he's talking about and a very witty tongue when it comes to breaking down what's really happening. But you've heard me set the table here, sir, on what's going on. It seems like, is, is this a desperation? Because they know everybody's laughing at them. More and more real liberals like Seinfeld and John Cleese. Or is it a power trip that they're doing this? Where are we societally, globally? Why would the left ally itself with the radicalist forms of Islam that's running around jihading and murdering every Muslim that doesn't put a hood over their wife's head and chop their genitals off. I mean, why would feminist groups be defending in the news and, and calling me an Islamophobe because I am offended by going into a mall and seeing 50-something women all over the place with hoods over their heads with their husbands bugging their eyes out at me and staring at my daughters. I mean, I know an aggressive alien culture when I see it. It'd be like if we went to a time machine and brought back millions of Aztecs, you know, and they were suddenly eating people, you know, I would, or, or Nazis were running around at the mall, you know, in SS uniforms. If I, if I went to, to Barton Creek Mall and saw 40 or 50 people in Nazi uniforms, I would be offended. I'd be freaked out. I'd be, what on earth is this? Is this some type of joke? But, but, but it, it's so acceptable. It's a sacrament. Is it a hatred of the West? Is it a form of cuckolding? Is it a form of human cultural sacrifice to butcher the West? Stefan Molyneux, what are we currently facing? Well, I think it's all those things and more, Alex. Uh, but just before we get started, out of sympathy for your eye issues, uh, I just wanted to, to mention something. Um, see if you can recognize this quote. It's 100 miles to Chicago. We've got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark. And we're wearing sunglasses. And they made fun of Nazis, so I say arrest the Blues Brothers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, I think they're united by a hatred of the free market. You know, what do the left and other radical ideologies all have in common? It's the desire to use the violence and the power of the state to inter interfere with people's free choices. Uh, who they trade with, where they go to school, uh, who, where they want to live, what kind of neighbors they want to have. This is consistent through all of these ideologies. And you can see this mounting uh, opposition growing to all of this madness where people are so bothered by other people's free choices that these busybodies want to go in there with the guns and violence of the state and order people around because other people's choices trigger them into terrible, horrifying bouts of hysterical, fainting couch Victorian nonsense. And we just have to fight back. We have to say, look, I am going to make my choices according to my rational conscience. You make your choices according to your hopefully rational conscience. And as long as neither of us is initiating force against the other, live and let live. But that is how they're Exactly. They're saying I'm censoring because I don't like hoods over women's heads. No, if, if, if they're wearing hoods and, and, and that's their issue and they want to, that's fine. But they don't even let these women drive. They, they are kept captured creatures, basically like the, the families they find that live in basements that didn't know there was an outside world, that's slavery, that's not their right. Well, here's the challenge. Um, when I was growing up, and I think we're similar ages, but when I was growing up, the big fear, and, and rightly so, was communism. And communism was a world-dominating ideology disguised as a theoretical economic system. Now, there are uh, theological constructs in the world right now, which the West is staring down, which are world dominating the theocratic systems disguised as a religion. And that is the challenge. That is the challenge. If people want to have different beliefs, that's fine. But if they're not willing to support the separation of church and state, then all people of good conscience from atheists to agnostics to Christians to fundamentalists to whoever, all who oppose the separation of church and state are going to end up stifling the kind of debate that is the necessary traction for the advancement of civilization.
Well, that's right. I mean, that's the issue. If a woman is 18 years old and she wants to go live in a basement and be chained to a wall, wear a hood over her head and be beaten and have acid thrown in her face, she can sign waiver forms to do that under contracting. She has a right as an extreme libertarian. I think she has a right. People have a right to maim themselves, pour Drano in their eyes, the new sexy liberal thing. I'm not kidding, folks, if you haven't learned about this. I shouldn't have to pay for it. Somebody wants to have a sex change. Knock yourself out. I'm not paying for it. But these women are born into slavery. The dominant form of Islam is taking over. Our government's allied with it. Why are Western states, or tell me if you disagree, Stefan Molyneux, why are they allying with it so feverishly? Well, I mean, there's a long and complicated set of answers to that. Um, the, the one thing I will mention is that it's been fairly well shown in monkey studies, which is really the best place to go and study political motivations. Uh, a lot of apes, when they climb up the hierarchy, of political power within their own particular tribe when they gain more resources and become more alpha, they get dopamine in the brain. A dopamine is a highly addictive substance within the brain. It's something that's mirrored in cocaine addiction. So people who have climbed to the top of political power are literally physical addicts to that political power. And anything which threatens that addiction is going to be viewed as a high negative to them. And of course, something has been set up where anything where white people or Western people or European people or the European derived cultures, whenever we say our culture has great value, our history has great value, our traditions have great value, well, that's automatically racist. As if somehow you like Europe, you must inevitably hate the rest of the world or you like America, you must hate the rest of the world. So politicians view racism as something that can dislodge them from power, which takes them away from the dopamine hit of their addiction to political power. And we would not expect sensible decisions from any drug addict. And politics is one of the most dangerous drugs of all. Stefan, you sent over four or five articles you wanted to go over today. In fact, some of these articles I already had in my stack dealing with world developments that kind of illustrate uh, the point we are at right now. Uh, let's go over some of those. Europe will soon have more Muslims and Christians. Belgium warns against making an enemy of Islam at Brussels attacks hearing. But, but they're here bullying us. My guys were in France and Belgium. They were no-go bullied everywhere. Joe Biggs was in Afghanistan and Iraq, never experienced something like this. London's iconic red buses declare glory to Allah. Police unleash tear gas after massive migrant brawl erupts in Paris train station. A Soros fears collapse of EU due to refugee crisis, which they brought in. Europe refugee system in chaos. They want to find folks a quarter million euros for each immigrant they don't let in, including people with terrorist backgrounds. Uh, UK's equality chief who popularized the term Islamophobia admits, I thought Muslims would blend into Britain. I should have known better. Well, these are the useful idiots. There's a larger master plan. Let's walk through it. Well, of course, the idea that everybody values diversity is false. Even if we say diversity or multiculturalism is a value in society, and that is certainly arguable based upon the data, Alex, but even if we say it's some magical, wonderful value for there to be multiculturalism and diversity within a country, well, those groups that come in who don't value multiculturalism and diversity won't blend. This is, this is, not, that, this is not really complicated. Yeah, why won't Japan let Muslims in? Well, because Japan wants to say Japanese. And why is it that nobody gets that angry that Japan or China or Hong Kong are not letting Muslims in? Why don't people get angry that Saudi Arabia is not letting Muslims in? Because those countries don't suffer from the self-hating pathological white guilt that is used and has been used to strip mine resources from European and European derived cultures for the past 50 years. White people feel guilty. Ooh, you're a racist. Oh, I don't want to be a racist. Here, here's my entire country to prove that I'm not a racist. Here's my entire culture. I'm going to open all the borders. I'm going to surrender to this massive union of church and state known as Islam just because I don't want to be called a racist. And people in the West do not have the right to sell their freedoms for the sake of political correctness. The freedoms that our ancestors fought and bled and died for, we do not have the right to give that away. That which you create, you cannot hand away or destroy. And we have all inherited these freedoms in the West, and we should be guarding them fiercely with as much emotional and intellectual energy as we can, and not handing it away because we're scared of words. I asked you earlier, you started to get into it. Why do you think it's, it seems like it's doubled or tripled in the absurdity just in the last year, and then almost every month it seems to be compounding to levels of sheer lunacy, but on the campuses, on the government facilities, no amount of ridiculousness from banning brown paper bags, 
to the word mother and father. It's just, it's all like a religion. And so many people I know that call themselves leftist are just totally embracing it to the point now of if you say to someone on the street, let's go eat Mexican food, a white person will say to you, that's racist. You go, excuse me, and they go, don't say the word Mexican. And then literally, I was debating it yesterday with people, and this Hispanic lady goes, no, that's like you say Chinese food, or let's go eat soul food. It's not racist. I mean, the Hispanic people aren't the ones even pushing it. It's this weird, like, witch hunt, white mental illness, you know, freak show. I don't, I don't it's crazy, man. Well, it's all designed. You know, what does, uh, what does a particularly venomous animal do when it wants to bring you down, but it's smaller? Well, it bites you and injects the paralysis, and then it can feast on you at its leisure. And, and I think the reality is basically that the left is trying to paralyze and stifle all debate about anything sensible. People say, oh, let's have an honest conversation about race, or let's have an honest conversation about incompatible religious beliefs. But it's not an honest conversation unless you're, sure. you know white and feel bad and well said they're just ending debate they're stifling putting out you know a smoke screen when you talk about islam not being compatible there's this debate is it radical islam or is it islam whatever it is i've studied history the radical form of it is taking over and getting more radical they kill each other everywhere they are these wahhabists why is the west allying with it and what is political islam where is it going what do you expect to happen next stefan well it's going to go one of two ways and um I don't like to predict because that has an air of deterministic inevitability to it. Uh, it's going to go one of two ways, Alex, and I think that you and I uh, and the other freedom-minded people are all on the same battalion as far as this goes. It's going to go one of two ways. Either we are going to rediscover the value and civilization and liberties of the West and defend them strongly uh, and oppose ideologies that seek to, uh, to quench those and squelch those underfoot, uh, or they're going to win. You know, in any conflict between two groups, the most consistent group will always win. And um, the, the people who want to undo the freedoms of the West have been very consistent and very dedicated for decades. And you know, there's an old saying that civilization rises in hobnail boots and descends in silk slippers. You know, maybe we all just got a little lazy. Maybe we just took all these freedoms for granted and assumed they were gonna stick around like the laws of physics. Well, they don't. Everything that is good in this world erodes without strong rehabilitation and reinforcement. And uh, we've just kind of gotten lazy. We're crossing our fingers. You know, there's studies that show that second and third generation Muslims in England are more radicalized than their parents. It's not only that they're not integrating, they're actually going in the opposite direction. And where does this lead? This idea that we can buy five more minutes peace from the verbal abuse of being called a racist or an Islamophobe as if... Uh, as if Islam is even a race. That's like being called a racist for criticizing communism. We all focus on this idea that we can get five more minutes peace and they'll just leave us alone for five more minutes. That has never, ever ended well in human history, to my knowledge. That's right. And communism was funded by some of the criminal elements in the West. It's now been declassified to create a big enemy to fight with. And, and, and the PNAC documents, Dick Cheney writes, we're going to radicalize Islam, stir them up and then have this 100-year Americana reign off fighting them. Well, I said that was immoral and evil. But what's even more evil is to actually make a deal and say, no, you're going to be the new culture, and then overrun everything that's created such incredible liberal freedom for everybody, because I'm a real liberal. I mean, you know, I mean, when you get down to brass tacks, I'm, I'm into people having their own freedoms. I mean, I have some of my own you know, conservative views, how I want to live, but I'm liberal when I say, hey, I'm very tolerant. Hey, I'm not trying to run your life, but... They want to run my life, so they're such control freaks, they want to ally with it when it's never going to ally with them. So uh, is this a double cross of Islam, a setup, a clash of civilizations, or what's really happening, Stefan? Well, there are, of course, uh, decent Muslims in the West who came to the West because they didn't like living in Muslim countries. And they wanted to be able to practice their faith free of Sharia law and some of the brutal enforcements that occur in Islamic countries. But this is a reformation. These people are seen as heretics. Oh, absolutely. But see, those of us in the West who value freedoms don't have the right to sell the freedoms that the Muslims who've come to the West to escape Sharia law, we don't have the right to sell their freedoms off either. What needs to happen in the West, and of course, this is something, in my opinion, as Donald Trump has talked about it as well, is that um, immigration as a whole has been going completely haywire for 50 or 60 years, basically since the 65 Act under Kennedy, which shifted, in particular in America, uh, immigration from Europe which is America's traditional feeding stock for immigration, to third world countries. And what's happened is uh, now 
they've got a huge number of incompatible cultures coming in, and that's fine if you have a small number and you give them time to assimilate and integrate. And find out if the experiment is going And if you don't give them welfare and put them in public schools brainwashing them into race groups. Well, that's key as well. I'm, I'm for the free movement of people, but you can either have open borders or you can have a welfare state. You can't have both. Exactly. You can't have a free lunch and not put a wall around it. Well, I think that's fair. And if we look at what's going on, uh, this question that's coming up uh, soon, right, which is the, the Brexit question, whether England should continue to lash itself to the uh, decisions of the all-wise, all-powerful bureaucrats. And let's and define this. Talk EU. about what, how the EU operates. We'll go to break and talk about Brexit. This is so big, I want to kind of shoot a flare up on this or, 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 or you know, embolden this with highlighter, you know, yellow marker with Stefan Molyneux uh, joining us from freedomainradio.com because this is the big issue. Globalism is in crisis. You're answering the question now. It's being reversed, which is why it's pushing authoritarianism. Spend a minute as we go to break on how the euro operates. Well, the euro is the outgrowth of the fantasy that a lot of globalists and a lot of the elites and a lot of the socialists and communists have. And the fantasy is, Alex, well, we are just one additional bureaucratic government coercive layer away from paradise. You know, four more regulations and we achieve nirvana in the West. And this, of Valhalla. course, is a complete disaster. And all of these additional layers of bureaucracy, all of this distancing of power from the voters and the taxpayers has produced all of the same disasters that we would expect from something like the USSR, which collapsed of its own overhead. Stay there. Let's talk about it. Now, I've been in London a lot. Just as I was, I've been to London like five or six times, but... When I went, went there in, the, in, in 2005 for the first time to cover the, the uh, London bombing, which had been provocateur, and I was there, the Muslims weren't as aggressive and mean, but I've been there like four or five times after. They're very aggressive and getting a lot of folks' face. And when you get to the airport, uh, you know the price is supposed to be to your hotel, and, they, and they'll all get together and go, no, triple. And then you've got to wait, I'm sorry, till somebody from the UK shows up they go, no, I know, it's horrible, it's illegal, they're not supposed to do that, but they do that because they hate Westerners so much. And it's just when people are hating you and you've been taught to be liberal and to spread your legs metaphysically and culturally to it, and that doesn't even please them. It only makes them know you're weak, you're here to roll over, and they come from countries where they're killing each other and can't even get civilization. It's just like, what is the elite thinking? Stefan? Well, there's always the... Um at least to me, the, the implied and implicit threat, right? So what, a day or two after Sadiq Khan became the Muslim uh, mayor of London, uh, he tweeted out, said, Trump's ignorant view of Islam could make both our countries less safe. It risks alienating mainstream Muslims. Well, um, that's sort of like, you know, nice little democracy you got going on here. It'd be a real shame if something happened to it, like if it caught fire or something. I mean, this is terrible stuff. I mean, this idea that, and this is not just with, with Islam, this is uh, throughout the left and the Green Movement as well, who have uh, some prominent people in the Green Movement are all for massive human depopulation. Uh, they've talked about uh, criminal charges against people who are skeptical of the uh, Mad Hatter pseudoscience of global warming. And this idea that people who disagree with you should end up in jail is so fundamentally against the Western tradition of free speech goes all the way back John Milton with Ario Pagetica, who made the case that the best cure for bad ideas is public exposure. If people have bad ideas, offensive ideas, let's get them out into the open. Let's have them debate because they assumed people had the rational crit critical thinking skills to separate good arguments from bad arguments. But one of the fundamental problems, Alex, as you know, that's happened in the West is government schools have gotten worse and worse and worse. And now a lot of people, I think particularly the elites, no longer trust the average person in the West to be able to distinguish a good argument from a bad argument, facts from fantasies, empiricism from nonsense. And therefore, because you don't trust the people to know a good idea from a bad idea, you have to control what the people have access to. And we see this happening all over. You know, the left is, oh, we're so into diversity. Boy, diversity and multiculturalism is so great. Yeah. When was the last time the New York Times put an ad out saying, we need a libertarian or a Republican on our editorial page because we're all leftists. So we really want to branch out. When was the last time academia said, we really want to hire someone in the social sciences. Let's make sure that they're into some libertarian or Republican philosophy. They don't. They don't. And that's so fundamental. The left 
has no interest in diversity whatsoever. What they do want to do is bring incompatible cultures together so that they can troll people who say, I don't know that this experiment is going to work really well. And they can say, ah, you're a racist, you're a bigot, and that's the way that they... And then they can also the referee, they can referee the ensuing crisis that comes out of it. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's it's like a chemistry set, chemistry. taking five or six things you know are going to explode and going, you need to buy bomb insurance, <laughs> blows up, see, I told you. Well, so let's, let's take the refugee. That, that's the big crisis. We started talking about the EU. There are two problems that the European Union has had to deal with that are the most important, I think. Uh, number one was the financial crisis. And the financial crisis basically came about because Germany, by being a relatively responsible country, had very low interest rates because it didn't have a very high debt to GDP ratio. And a lot of the other countries, yes, I'm looking at the pigs, right? Portu Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and, and Spain, and so on. A lot of the other countries who had bad interest rates wanted to hook into German interest rates so they could borrow at a lower rate. Sure, I mean, if I'm an irresponsible spendthrift and you're a responsible person, I want us to split the difference in our interest rates. That hurts you, but benefits me. And so the EU extended after Greece in particular used Goldman Sachs to lie and falsify its records in order to get into the EU. These countries that had bad spending habits hooked into more responsible countries' interest rates and blew themselves up in an orgy of fiat currency spending. And then when they ran out of money and, and the crap hit the fan, uh, they started threatening Europe with bailouts. And in particular, uh, Greece threatened Europe with flooding it with third world migrants unless they paid up. And that, if that's not a mafia style shakedown, I don't know this should have come from Italy. If that's not a mafia style shakedown, I don't know what is. So the financial crisis led to the migrant crisis and it's all turning into a complete disaster. And that which was supposed to unify and solve most of the problems in Europe has no, now turned into the sort of downkeys that is actually hanging right over the neck of European civilization, which has survived for thousands of years, but night might not be able to survive the collectivism of Brussels. Continue before we go to calls. I know you've got a lot of angles, a lot of points. I've kind of been bringing up some of my own questions here, Stefan, but uh, what are some of the other angles you want to alert people to? Well, there's this idea in Europe, in the EU. Uh, sorry, I was waiting for your big speech. I'm shocked that it came back to me, but I can do it. I can hang it. So uh, in the EU, there's this idea that if you want to have free trade, somehow that involves universal citizenship. There's no other country in the world that I know of that, that pursues this at least as strongly as the EU does. You know, I order something from China and I open it up. I don't get a Chinese passport in there as well. Free trade and the unfettered movement of people is something that is in no way related. And trying to unite these two has been a complete disaster. Of course, also, in, uh, in the refugee situation, according to the European statutes, the refugee, if they're genuinely an asylum seeker or fleeing war, they must stay in the first country they land in. They're not allowed to go welfare shopping as substantial proportions of them do, which is why they want to get say, to Germany, which has a very strong welfare state, and away from Italy, which is much more restrictive and doesn't take as many asylum applications. So a basic rule is you've got to stay in the first country that you land in, and that has been almost in nowhere enforced in the euro. There are so many other restrictions that the euro is supposed to put on its member states, like your debt to GDP is supposed to stay low. Many countries have blown past that with no repercussions, no ramifications whatsoever. So when England is thinking of leaving the EU, I would ask the British people, what is the EU? Is it a set of rules? Well, if those rules aren't enforced, can it even be said to exist? It is a massive pension fattening scheme for the useless, loathsome, spotty behind bureaucrats that in That's right, the and, and, and you got interrupted by the break getting into the type of tyranny that the EU's involved in. I mean, the UK and most other countries never voted to enter it. They're in it. It makes most of your laws, and then it threatens giant quarter million euro pound uh, fines if you don't accept whoever they say and even try to vet them. I mean, it's like, we're all powerful. Take these people. We're going to find you. You never voted to enter us, and we rule you now. It's so dictatorial, and the fact that the Brexit's happening is so exciting. Okay, so if you're a British business, right, small to medium-sized business, about 5% of those businesses in the UK trade with the EU. But 100% of those businesses are subject to the endless conveyor belt of tiny print, two-point squinto vision regulations coming out of Brussels. Since 2010, the EU has introduced over 3,500 new laws affecting British business. 
Now, if you're a giant corporation, well, you have a big legal department, you can do your regulatory capture and get the ear of the bureaucrats and offer them whatever incentives you could. So big companies, they don't mind it so much, but it's the small to medium sized companies that end up being drowned, literally drowned under this deluge of regulations. When Britain first joined the EU, it had 20% of the votes. Now it's down below uh, 10%. There are hundreds of new laws and regulations that the British MPs strongly oppose, which get passed anyway. England has given away its sovereignty. That is such an astonishing thing. The British pound is one of the few fiat or semi-fiat currencies that have survived for 400 years. British sovereignty as an island, I grew up in England, was something that was considered to be one of the greatest treasures that God, nature, and geography had provided a civilized race. And the idea that in a decade or two, England would have given away its sovereignty to unelected, unaccountable people in Brussels. They suffer no negative consequences for their unbelievably terrible decisions. The idea that you would cede sovereignty to faceless bureaucrats in another country is unbelievably astonishing to me. And as soon as the British people wake up to what's happening, the vote that's coming up should be a no brainer. For the average low level leftist, I think a lot of them are just in a cult and they just follow whatever the latest trendy uh, directives are. And they're kind of scared. I've talked to a lot of them and no political correctness is getting really weird. But still, they really think that if they don't go along with it, they'll get in trouble. Uh, it's, it's all just intimidation. They should just get off the cult. They should leave the reservation. Well, look, if I say my arguments are good, otherwise shadowy, unknown, apocalyptic disaster occurs, that's usually an indication that my arguments aren't really good. Like, I don't need to say to you, Alex, you know, two and two make four, and if you don't believe me, your studio is going to collapse, right? I mean, if I have a good argument, I have a good argument. You've got David Cameron now going around saying, if England leaves the EU, war across Europe, conflagrations, destructions, genocides. I mean, this is apocalypse. This is Pascal's wager. Ooh, massive disasters occur if you don't obey my particular political opinion. This is all madness. The idea, and this is another example of how one government program which fails is supposed to lead to another one. Wasn't the agency or the group that was supposed to keep European peace called NATO? And hasn't that done a pretty good job since the Second World War of keeping European peace along, of course, with the mutually assured destruction and the spread of the free market to some degree? But the idea that now, if England leaves the EU, there will be war. I mean, it's like this has become completely lunatic. In other words, if there are borders, there are wars. Well, that's insane. Um, when, when countries tend to blend together that don't fit, that's when the greatest conflict occurs. If you look at what happened in Bosnia and Serbia. Sure, of course. They, I mean, they want crisis. They together, want war. Boom. They want consolidation. That's why they're creating order out of chaos, which gives them more power and more control. Uh, I don't see this going well for them. You know, the BRICS exit, the BRICS exit, all of this, I think, signals the death of globalism, and somebody like Donald Trump comes along and says globalism is bad, it's a one-sided deal, and then they get so angry at him and try to say he's a racist, it just shows that it's a military brainwashing system. Well, I mean, uh, Donald Trump's, uh, frankly, in my view, magnificent foreign speech policy, where he said that America was going to withdraw from the idea of nation building. Nation building got an unfairly good reputation after the Second World War, after the massive bombings in Germany and in Japan. Those cultures reformulated themselves from, you know, pretty fascistic and psychotic, warmongering, lunatic cultures to relatively peaceful, relatively secular free market democracies. Now that you know, this has the whole thing to do with the average IQ of nations. You know, if you blow up Germany and you blow up Japan, really smart people go, well, that's a really, really bad thing. And therefore, they end up reconstituting their societies along more peaceful and I dare say Western lines. However, there are people or groups that if you uh, dismantle their existing societies, uh, you don't get uh, post-World War to uh, Japan and you don't get post-World War to Germany. They degenerate you, even worse. You get ISIS. Yeah, you get ISIS. Some people, when bad things happen to them, they make better decisions. Other people, when bad things happen to them, well, they just make worse and worse decisions. Uh, and again, we can, I've talked about ethnicity and IQ, and, and people can just look up IQ around the world. There may be some reasons for this. I don't know. Nobody knows the exact reasons for it, but it's not a bad place to start. So the idea that Donald Trump is saying America's foreign policy is going to be determined by that which is good for America, rather than these globalist fantasies of walking around the, the, the world like some ironclad iron man Julius Caesar waving your magic wand of violence to create paradise. My God, that's taken too long for America to take that uh, perspective back. And I hope that he follows through on it.
Well, with all the nuclear weapons and things we've got, we've got to stop having these wars. And all I know is globalists claim globalism is going to stop war. All it's doing is starting more war. Well, but, you know, the other thing, and I, I said this many years ago, another thing I think that's important, Alex, I think it's hard to look at Western politics at the moment without understanding the basic fact that the governments are out of money. Uh, a journalist on uh, white slavery going on worldwide, and every time I say that, ignorant people go, why don't you hear about black slavery? White slavery, sex slavery, folks, okay, and, and children. So that's coming up very, very important. It's worse than it's ever been. Islam all over the world's running it, and like, what, eight, nine countries still have it legal, but that's okay. I'm the problem, because I think everybody should have equal freedom. Uh, it's crazy. I want to go to John and a few other callers. Uh, Stefan wants to get into the left and leftist atheism uh, as well. I know he's an expert on that, but briefly, real fast, John in California, you're on the air with Stefan Molodu of FreeDomainRadio.com. Thanks, guys. Good to talk to you. Uh, I had a question about the, the recent administration's decision to start cooperating with Iran in, in the negotiations that are uh, sometimes somehow easing relations, relations with the countries. Is this a stand down like they did with Libya, or is there some other sort of game plan that's going on? Sure, I don't want a war with Iran, but and, and so I say leave them alone, but it is a one-sided weird deal. There's something going on behind it. Stefan, you're a smart guy. What do you think is going on? Well, it is, of course, the, the history of Americans' relationship with Iran is long and complex and generally does not look that great for America. Um, I, I think that the, the, in order to understand what it's like to deal with uh, Islamic countries and Islamic fundamentalists, you simply need to understand the life of Muhammad and you need to read your Quran. And uh, Islam, like a lot of ideologies in the world, uh, creates an us versus them mentality. Those within the group are good. Those who are on the outside of the group are not good. And your moral obligations, this is one of the problems I have with atheists and one of the huge amounts of respects that I have for Christianity. Christianity has a universal ethical standard. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not do unto other Christians, uh, but do unto others as a whole. And you have to be wary when you're dealing with uh, philosophies that say, I have no moral obligations that extend beyond my own particular group. Uh, those are very slippery and dangerous people to try and get into deals with because you don't sure. have the Well, it creates like an artificial psychopathic or sociopath position where you know, this isn't a human. You've dehumanized them, you know, like the Nazis or whatever. Or you're not a communist. I'm going to kill you. You're not a Muslim. I'm going to kill you. Or you're not a radical enough Muslim. I'm going to kill you. It's an excuse to run wild. That's a great question and a segue into your point on leftist atheists. What's, what's your view on them? Well, the question is, why has everything become so hysterical and coercive and verbally abusive with people getting arrested for talking about various factual things about other ideologies? I think one of the fundamental reasons is that atheists as a whole have hacked at the idea of a personal conscience. Uh, Christianity, uh, one of the great glories of Christianity is the degree to which uh, it encourages people to be good and internalizes the standards of virtue so that people pursue virtue for the sake of being closer to God, for the sake of getting into heaven and so on. It internalizes the conscience. When atheism came along and said, well, to heck with uh, Christianity, uh, they also said to some degree to heck with the foundation and structure and support. That's that right. They say we're animals and just programmable. But well, then I'm just programmed by the government. I mean, that's not true. I do have free will. I am innate. I can create. I mean, it's almost like saying... A atheists don't want to believe that humans can do incredible stuff. I'm saying we're made in the image of God. We can do amazing things. I like that superhero aspect. They're saying, no, no, you're just nothing. Decisions have already been made for you. And it seems like a kind of an anthill type cult or something is another religion. Well, society has got to be organized in some fashion. I mean, we, we have to organize society. And you can say, well, we're going to get rid of the conscience. We're going to get rid of the Christian fealty to virtue. But what do you replace it with? And I would argue and have argued in a recent series of videos that what, state, what, what atheists replace the Christian conscience with is the edicts of state power. I call them statheists because they're atheists in that they don't believe in what they consider one ir irrational authority, but they Statheist. replace it with a far more dangerous irrational authority called the state. You can be religious, I cannot be religious, we can both live peacefully side by side. But if you believe that the state should organize my life, we're going to come into conflict. Uh, let's take a call from the great north, uh, from John in Canada. John, go ahead and make your point. Yeah, good day, Alex. Uh, good day, Steph. Um, right now in Canada, I see I see a lot of Syrian refugees coming in. They decide to uh, take Muslims over precedence over the cops and Yudis. Uh I'm a vet, so uh, I, I've worked on, on Syrian issues before. And 
I'm just wondering, what can we do now that we've been given this big blank muffin to chew on? You know, we don't want to alienate the good guys to have them become radicalized later. Like, I, well, I'm sure, that's so, the excuse. Bring a bunch in from radical areas. Be nice to them so they're not radical. Stefan was covering that earlier. It doesn't help. It makes them worse. That's what the studies show. And so the question is, the immigration level is much bigger than they're admitting. We've proven that here in the U.S. It's probably 50 times what they're saying. I mean, each high school has like 200 plus people. They claim the whole state has 400 refugees. Austin's got tens of thousands. I mean, you ought to go to the mall. It's like I live in, you know, Baghdad or something. I don't even Baghdad. It's like I live in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I appreciate your call, sir, from Canada. Uh, what do you make of what he's saying? Because, I mean, the numbers are much larger, which shows me it is a secretive program. They admit Europe covered up the real numbers. What's going on here? Look, if we say that we must self-censor because other people might get upset, we've already lost free speech. Fascism finally emerges after people have been silenced already, and that way they have very little left to lose. Yes. And so we must continue to speak the truth. I really dislike the idea that we can't criticize groups because it might upset them. Hey, as a white male, I've taken a lot of criticism over the years, a white patriarch, racist, you know, whatever. And nobody's really caring that much about my feelings, so I'm really not sure that I should overly work myself. Well, I was about, about to say, I used to be more politically correct because I was mainly covering globalism, the New World Order, the Federal Reserve, big issues. But now it's gotten so bullying, so out of control. I know I've got to show folks to have the courage to practice the First Amendment or we're going to lose it. Well, and the other thing, too, look, I think everybody with compassion looks at the wreckage uh, that American foreign policy and aggression has wreaked in the sure. Middle East. I mean, we so we feel Libya, sorry we and say bring them in, but the same Iran folks that did that are the ones bringing them in. Well, here's the thing, though. Look, if those wars were justified, then you don't take the victims of war. If those wars were not justified, as I believe they weren't, then maybe you can start looking into war crimes trials for your own leaders. That's right. Know. Let's execute the people that launched the phony wars. Let's not blame the country and then bring the people in. So if you care about the refugees, and I do, then you look at it rationally and critically, and you say, what is more expensive? We have finite resources. In all societies, we have finite resources. How can we best help those people? Well, Studies have shown very clearly it costs about $1,000 to resettle a migrant in the Middle East. And in the U.S., it costs $13,000 to bring them to the U.S. And that's just short term. The, the numbers go up from there. So if you want to help people in the Middle East, talk to your governments and sure. say, let's take our tax money or let's take our private charity and help the Muslims resettle in the Middle East to countries that have sure, the same Sure, but language, I mean, uh, this final culture, point, Stefan. 80% are military age men. Most of them are people that invaded Syria. Now they're getting their butt kicked by the Russians, so they're going into Turkey. And they're being used as a political tool. They're getting more money than citizens get. And most of them are radical Wahhabists. They're not letting Shiites or Christians who need to get out in. Have you noticed that? Well, the Prime Minister of Canada was willing to accept uh, Christians, and, uh, well, then he got voted out.